creative living. Utilizing today's technology with the best of the past to bring you innovative ideas and up-to-date information for creative lifestyles in today's active world. With your host, Cheryl Borden. I'm so glad you joined me today for Creative Living. We're going to discuss the psychology of color in terms of interior design, and we'll show how to use a new template when making quilts. One of my guests today is Diane Romick, and she's an interior designer from Newport Coast, California. Diane says that if a homeowner starts with an emotion they want to feel in a room, then the outcome can be very different compared to starting with the function of a room or their favorite color. She'll explain more about the psychology of color for interior design. She's the owner of Castle Design Studio. We'll begin the show today with Margaret Miller, who is an author and quilter. Margaret's going to show a template called Angle Play. This tool makes working with the long right triangle edges in quilting much easier to piece, regardless of the excess seam allowance. Her business is Miller Quilts Incorporated in Bremerton, Washington. Margaret, it's so nice to have you here. We have similar backgrounds in that we both love uh, clothing and textiles and, and design work, but you, it was interesting because you said you never in the world dreamed you'd be doing quilting. Oh, absolutely. I, if, if I had to characterize myself, I would think I would never have the patience for quilting. <laughs> but quilting is like jigsaw puzzles for me. It's just putting pieces together and you don't really, having a jigsaw puzzle without a box top is what quilting that's is. That's interesting. And you've written books, which for people like me, that's, mm -hmm. that's such a blessing because mm -hmm. I I say I can copy almost anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not original, so it's nice that there's people like you who do the hard work for the rest of us. Well, it's the fun of it. You know, one idea leads to 14 others in quilting. Oh. And I bet every one of your students shares something that uh, even makes it more interesting. Oh, Is absolutely. that right? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to talk about angle play mm -hmm. and triangles. And of course, there's all kinds of shapes in quilts, but the one that always pops out to me are the triangles. Exactly. In traditional patchwork, and of course patchwork and applique are the two basic basic techniques of quilting, uh -huh. but in patchwork the two traditional shapes that we've always, u always used are squares, squares and half square triangles right here. Mm -hmm. Half square because triangles, uh -huh. exactly. But when you start taking rectangles and cutting them apart, you create all kinds of new angles mm -hmm. that put the traditional patchwork blocks in motion. And, and I said the beauty of quilts are having them at a distance that you can spot because when I was looking at this earlier, I just saw a mass of beautiful colors. Right. But now these triangles that you're talking about really pop. Well, and together you see they make curves and uh -huh. that's, that's what we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh -huh. Okay, we're going to learn how to do this. Exactly, exactly. All all right, this shows you what the traditional forms of patchwork are. There are squares and half square triangles, but when you start cutting rectangles apart, notice that you're adding many, many uh -huh. different angles to those two that They're tall are and part skinny of the, points. Very tall and skinny. And the problem with these has been that it's hard to uh, tell when you add a, a half square, a, when you add a quarter inch seam to a long triangle, there's lots of excess seam allowance mm -hmm. off the point. What do you do at the top? So I developed these templates so that mm. I've lopped them off and each template, and there are 13 in the set, each one is lopped off at just the right angle so you don't have to think about how to cut them apart. Like I said, I'm glad there's people like you who, who do this. <laughs> All right, so oh. as the triangle, now this is a long rectangle triangle, but as the tri triangle approaches a half square triangle shape, notice there's hardly anything lopped mm -hmm. off. The more long and skinny the rectangle gets, oh. notice that it's almost blunt cut mm -hmm. at the top. So that's what makes it a, such a, 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 a new shape, and now it's easy to work with. So you say. I do. <laughs> we're going I to do. learn how. What we're dealing with, I'm going to change our order just a little okay. bit here. What we're dealing with is the fact that you can't just take a rectangle of fabric, cut it corner to corner, and know how to sew it back together again. This shows you how much excess seam allowance there mm -hmm. is off the top. Notice also that when you draw a rectangle, add the quarter inch seam, when you cut it in half, that diagonal doesn't go through the corner of the cutting line, and that's what people don't understand. Right. What do you do with that So top? that is why we've developed the templates that are lopped off at just the right angle. Mm. One little detail I might add in the beginning is that I press the seams open. This really, really helps for the accuracy. I think so. Angle play teaches you about accuracy, that's mm -hmm. for sure. 
So I'd like to show you how to cut these templates. Here's an example of a block, the, a traditional, uh, of a 12 inch quilt block. Mm -hmm. And notice that the using long triangles really creates an elegance to the block and a movement. So I'd like to show you how to, um, how to, to talk about how to cut these out. Now, when you start, you're going to need to pay attention because this is now a directional triangle. It's either a left-facing triangle or a right-facing right. one. And so it makes a difference. It makes a big difference. <laughs> so what it means is, for the most part, you're going to be cutting with all your fabrics right side up, but you may be cutting with the template right side up or, or the template uh -huh. wrong side up. So what this means is you're guaranteed to miscut a number of times. <laughs> That's what happens. So um, notice that in a block, you, you don't need just one of every, mm -hmm. any given shape. Often in a 12-inch block, you need four. So I'm going to show oh. you how to cut four at a time. And we're using a rotary cutter and a rotary and mat. And a rotary mat, mm -hmm. yes. Now, I'm going to cut a rectangle that's about a half inch taller and a half inch wider than the actual template itself. And remember we said we need to have all our fabrics right side up. Uh -huh. So I'm going to start by putting them right side up. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to place the template such that the two, the two sides that are going to create the rectangle, obviously you want on the straight of the grain. So I'll put those on the straight of the grain and in a little bit. I'm going to cut the diagonal and notice that by rotating the two on top of the oh, other two, uh -huh. you can cut all four there, at once. Now, this rotating uh, board, cutting board, is a lifesaver in this. I've never seen one that rotated oh, like that. Or That's you wonderful. can use a smaller board that you can rotate yourself on your bigger board. Uh -huh. And just that fast, we have the four, four. points of the star that we may have in in any given in this block. pattern. Uh -huh. So as you see, it's very, very fast to cut to, to cut the mm -hmm. shapes. All right, the templates themselves have a number of other lines. There's a half size line uh, mm -hmm. so that you can make a template that's this size or full size. Mm -hmm. But notice there's also a diagonal seam. And what that diagonal seam opens up is the possibility of doing a pieced triangle. Oh, now you've made two out exactly. of that one. Exactly, and uh -huh. there's a really f slick way in both of the books that shows you how to cut this really, really fast. But you see this yellow buttercup in the middle was enabled by uh -huh. that ha that pieced triangle. Here's another quilt that shows a pieced triangle. Now these were little blocks. These were like eight inch, 10 inch blocks. But notice that instead of restricting them to a square edge like we normally do, by using that pieced triangle, you can let the color curved. bleed out mm -hmm. into the background so you create a softer, rounder edge to the block. So now mm -hmm. we're ready for that board that shows you how curves can develop using these templates. Notice in this one, for example, you have what almost looks like an appliqued edge, but that is all accomplished and it's with a cir almost a circle. Absolutely, That's what you, you see. do, mm -hmm. you do, and you get undulating lines, and it's all straight line piecing, and you get sharp, sharp points every time. This mm -hmm. one too has the illusion of curves, uh -huh. and using the templates and the you, choice of fabrics, and the choice is what of fabrics, it. it makes uh -huh. a big difference. All right, piecing has a little um, an extra information I'd like to share as well. Well, so when you have a shape like this that you, you want to sew together, obviously you want these four seams to come together mm -hmm. um, very well in the center. So what I do when I put them right sides together, I fold the top one back and then slide it one way or the other to make to sure match. that those two are lined up. And then for as you pin on either side of that seam, then you pin the two ends and what's significant, I'm just going to pin this really quickly, what's significant about angle play is that you, now this happens to be half square triangles, so mm -hmm. let's shelve that discussion for the next one. All right, here are, uh, uh, here's another typical joining of two units that make up an, a block that has mm -hmm. long triangles in it. Lots of seams. Lots of seams that come in at funny angles. Mm -hmm. Now, 
In angle play, you don't have the same kind of corner that you do in traditional patchwork. So in, there's no corner to match up. You oh. have all, it's already <laughs> been lopped of, off. Uh -huh. So when you're matching for a corner, you're matching this edge and this edge. Mm -hmm. You're matching edges, not, uh, not corners. Now also, when you have a unit like this, when you have this side and this side to consider, notice there's only one seam to be concerned about on this yeah. side. There mm. are two, two on this uh -huh. side. So when you put it through the machine, you would put it through this way so you can literally see, see what the you're points sewing. that you, mm -hmm. want, you want to match up. Mm -hmm. All right, in this one, here's one that's a little trickier, and this is the, the technique that I'm really, really excited about. You, what you want is to make this point right here match up to that point mm -hmm. perfectly. And so what mm -hmm. we're going to do, again, start by putting the right sides together, fold back the seam, and you see you can e see very easily whether it's going to mm -hmm. match up or not. Now, technically, when you fold it back up and match the raw edges, it should come out perfectly, should. but you can't <laughs> count on that. So I have what's called a perpendicular pin technique. You poke the pin in to the point that you know you want to hit. Then you poke the same pin into the point on the, the other layer. side uh -huh. that you know you want to hit. Put those two together and leave that pin perpendicular to the fabric. Then you pin normally on either side. Mm -hmm. And then you, of course, would pin the ends. And when you sew, you sew along and sew along. Leave that pin perpendicular until you can't sew anymore. Uh -huh. And it then holds that it, right it, there. it will be absolutely perfect when it comes out. Right here, right, right here. there. Uh -huh. That's right. It, and, and they come in. At, all the seams come in at such angles. Beautiful. Such Just angles. Beautiful. Thank you. I think seeing the quilts is what really yes. is, is All right. interesting. This shows you how dramatic that you can get one-way directional blocks with mm -hmm. angle play with those Look long all triangles. And all those points would scare quilters normally. But with these templates, they're going to come out perfect every time. This is another example of a quilt with um, a one-way design. And the pattern for this is in the angle play quilts book. So I have a couple of quilts to show you that, that show a couple aspects of uh, what you can do with angle play. Notice if you add striped fabrics, if you add variegated fabrics, this is a polka dot that went from magenta to peach, uh -huh. and you see by cutting it different ways you create quite a lot of drama in the quilt oh, itself. You do. And then we have another one right behind you, right and this one. I love the vibrant colors. I think oh, your technique I, I shows up color. I even love better. Color. This quilt was based on one quilt block that was just rotated. Oh. You can make the block not really knowing what the quilt is you're going to make, and <laughs> just play with it on the wall and see what happens. Well, I would say this is great for people who have quilted a little bit, but for those of us who are novices, I think we better start somewhere a little bit less intense. But oh. these are the most beautiful quilts I've ever seen. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you very so much. much, Margaret. So nice to be with you. Diane, it's such a pleasure to have you here. I'm just going to pick your brain about so many things because I think your field of interior design is so interesting. And I knew we were going to talk about that and I knew we'd talk about color because obviously that's a big part of redesigning a, a room. But what do you mean when you talk about the psychology of color? Well, Cheryl, thank you so much for having me again. And, and thinking about colors, it's not just a matter of um, we pick a color the color a lot of times will impact us. So we get to impact a room by choosing the colors, but then the surprising result sometime is that the room is really impacting us. And so we've got to take that into account when we choose the colors originally. Well, I've always heard that, that you would talk to the, to the homeowner and say, you know, what is this room used for? And mm -hmm. they might say resting or activities or whatever. But color really probably is should be the first choice, shouldn't it? Well, it's interesting, it, it should be, and yet you can't just kind of dive right <laughs> in to what's the favorite color. Uh -huh. But I am curious, what is your favorite color? I think it would be red, but not Christmas red, more like a jewel tone red, kind of a maybe into the burgundy reds or mm -hmm. something. So very specific, 
Not just red. Uh -huh. Yes, right? not like, just red. Like I'm very specific. <laughs> and then do you have any colors that you really don't care for? Probably more like grays or beige. To me, they're just kind of blah. Mm. So I tend to like jewel tone colors. Mm -hmm. They kind of keep you cheery and happy. Uh -huh. Yeah. So thank you because you walked right into my, my statement that our emotions are so connected oh. to the colors. Uh -huh. And so, for example, like you were saying a moment ago, if we started off in a room and we talked just function, mm -hmm. or if we talked just color, then we're missing the emotion. Hmm. And so it's kind of fun if we start off first talking about emotion. And let's say, for example, there's a couple and they want to revise their living room. And so if I were to just start off with color questions, then she could say, I love red, orange, yellow. And he says, whoa, tan and brown, please. <laughs> and, and yet, if I can get them onto the same page, kind of like an arbitration, uh -huh. you know, where they always yes. say find a shared value. Uh -huh. So if we find out and it's from a conversation that they both want to have kind of a nice social space, a little mm -hmm. bit of energy in there, mm -hmm. that will help us choose the colors. Okay. And we might take a look at this because I think it's interesting to know what color does what. Let's talk about blue, for instance. Mm -hmm. What does that do for us? Well, blue is, is actually a super popular color right now. Mm -hmm. And so... Blue gives us peaceful, calming, tranquil feelings. Uh-huh. Restful. But, right. There's, there's always two sides to every story, though, and uh -huh. our own personal biases can change a color. So science might say one generality, but uh, personal opinion is very important. And for a lot of people, blue is very depressing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, and I... I I think of it as a cold color, but maybe that's the shade of blue. If it has a little yellow in the blue, maybe that makes it warmer. Well, instead of a cold, uh, you know, a, I guess I'd call it a, a red blue. <laughs> it, it's very important what you just mentioned with undertones. And if, if we looked at a color wheel, mm -hmm. then we would be able to see marked right on here, warm colors this way, uh -huh. cool colors that way. Right. And so it just splits right around to the very bottom. And so all of these are warm colors, and the opposite side, cool colors. Uh -huh. And yet, certainly, they, they can all be altered here and there by different uh -huh. undertones. I but see. for the most part, it's uh -huh. pretty black or white, if black you will. Black or white. <laughs> okay, and uh, I mentioned I like red. Let's see, it says enthusiasm, warmth, comfort. But then it says hostility and aggression. <laughs> I don't like that too much. <laughs> don't take that personally. Okay. Calm down. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, um, the thing about red is that a lot of people will have um, memories connected to a color from their childhood. And red, for example, is the color of ambulances. So, so perhaps a child had a, an illness mm -hmm. when they were young. So in the back recesses of their mind, it mm -hmm. might mean that red for them is scary. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter what somebody's favorite color is. If for a person the room is scary uh -huh. subconsciously, that's not, good. Uh -huh. that's not nice. We you mentioned wanna... one, talking about uh, uh, the wife maybe liking the warm colors of oranges and reds. How do you? How did you come to a solution for this family? Well, <laughs> because that's quite different from this one to this one. Well, and to be fair, these are kind of funny nightmare interpretations. <laughs> so if, for example, that couple had just gone pure color, um, he would probably be imagining this nightmare mm. of a space. Uh -huh. Um, when she said oranges, reds, yellows, she's imagining this nightmare of a brown Blah. and tan, <laughs> brown, yeah, uh -huh. icky space. And so um, if we get them on the same page with the emotion that it needs to be social, but we can knock out any colors that somebody really doesn't like mm -hmm. because of whatever subconscious reasons, then we can find a really happy, <laughs> a happy medium. Uh -huh where you've incorporated what science says about having some of those energetic colors. Uh -huh. Through the but, orange accents. Uh -huh. mm -hmm, exactly. And yet we're not doing it in an overwhelming way. We're respecting both parties. <laughs> Got to keep everybody happy. Yeah. That, that's a good compromise there. Uh, this is another example of a dining room. And 
Mm -hmm. I, I'm anxious to see what you come up with on this because <laughs> I, I definitely would have my, my opinions. Uh, this was the wife that wanted this? Correct, uh -huh. correct. The wife really likes Tiffany blue and silver and kind she's got this whole star. Maria Carey thing yeah. going. Uh -huh. Exactly. Kind of glamour. And, uh -huh. Perfect. And then the gentleman said, no, I want it to be like our country club. <laughs> Sage green, deep rose. Uh -huh. um, and when you get like a very stubborn couple, um, decorating, designing, any renovations, and it's sad to say can really tear a marriage apart. Uh -huh. And yet if we use the emotion driven, you know, find that shared value first, you know, for them kind of what they're both saying is um, they like luxury and drama. Hmm. And then if he says, well, that Tiffany blue, no way. Uh -huh. And she says, oh, well, in that case, the dusty rose, no way, fine. So you can, we up can with have the, the remaining two colors that mm -hmm. working together is still going to give them the emotions, and yet neither one will be hostile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't need that hostility and aggression, do we? <laughs> so this is this is what the compromise was, and it's mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. It's a very okay. pretty space. Okay, so the psychology of color is very important. I, I mm -hmm. thought it was interesting when I was reading through the material you sent about prisons or holding yes. rooms, let's say the holding cells, that, that was interesting. Being pink? Yes. Surprisingly enough, when um, prisoners go into the temporary holding cells, quite often they are painted pink. The holding cells are painted pink because it's a, it's a color that drains the energy and calms people down. Mm. And what's really funny is that they used to do that same trick in the locker rooms just for the visiting sports team. Oh, is that right? Right. So uh -huh. only the visitors' locker would be painted Low pink. energy, blah, yeah. don't care about the game. <laughs> and to tell you how impactful it is, that became against regulations. So you can't do, can't that, do that anymore. No, I didn't but realize it's, that. Uh -huh. It's really significant. Well, it's really interesting. That's certainly true. And, mm -hmm. and I remember studying uh, uh, about the colors when I was in college, but it seems like... Uh, it, it's almost like in clothing every year our colors change. In the ha in the interior design business, does it change that often? Absolutely. And the clothing is always going to be faster to change uh -huh. just because they're typically less expensive objects. Oh, uh -huh. And yet, believe it or not, once a year there is an organization that meets and they decide what the next year or two's colors will be. And that's okay. why all of the new items that you see, all these manufacturers are kind of working within that same range of mm -hmm. colors. It's because it was already decided upon. I see. So you see all those bright orange appliances that's telling us that orange reds and the those colors are going to be good for a period of time. But right. you can't afford to change every year, so what do you suggest that people do? Do you say keep it kind of middle of the road? Well, it's it's kind of one or two extremes. Uh -huh. So one extreme would be, you know, you appreciate color and change and trends. So let's get the bones of your house in neutral colors. Uh -huh. So then you can always apply the pops of different colors and the trendy things and uh -huh. have your fun. Or if someone is just really truly in love and it makes them so happy to be in a space that's a specific color, uh -huh then really who cares about the trends and you can go all out with that color palette. Okay. <laughs> Got to keep everybody happy if we can. This Why is really not? interesting. Thank <laughs> you very much, Diane. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Next time on Creative Living, we'll learn who needs to be on our remodeling team before we undertake the project. We'll talk about foods that feed your brain and show some ways to redo a teen's bedroom on a budget. One of my next guests, who is an interior designer, will explain why it's important to hire the right team when doing a remodeling project. She'll explain who typically makes up a good team and share some of her thoughts about undertaking such a project. Another guest is a registered dietitian and author, and she's going to give us the lowdown on what foods and nutrients can help protect your brain and keep you smart today and down the road. And if you have a teenager at home who wants to redo their room, another guest will explain how to do this on a budget.
He says the environmentally friendly bedroom redo just features soap and water cleanup. All of these topics will be featured on the next Creative Living Show. If you ever have comments or suggestions or ideas for shows, you can email me at cheryl.borden at enmu.edu. I'd also like to ask you to become a fan of Creative Living on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com and in the search window, type in Creative Living with Cheryl Borden. Thanks so much. I hope you'll plan to join me next time for Creative Living. We are very pleased to offer a new booklet that accompanies this series of Creative Living. This booklet is titled the 6800 series and it features a wonderful collection of ideas and information and it's available free of charge on our website. Posted as a PDF file, you can simply download the entire booklet or just the segments you're most interested in. For your copy of this new booklet, go to our website at KENW.org and then click on Creative Living. Scroll down to the booklet section and you can click on the booklet or on any of the other booklets we have available online. We'd also like to invite you to sign up for our free e-newsletter. Just go to KENW.org and click on the Sign Up Now button and input your email address. Thank you.